and um, good lunchtime. It's neither just afternoon. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I'd like to start our proceedings with an acknowledgement of country um, by paying my respects to the traditional landowners of the land across Australia in all the places that we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. And a very big warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to meet with us today. I thought I'd start with a tiny bit of history. Um, this, this program called Reg Tech in the Bag was one of the first programs that I developed for the association. And it was really um, a program uh, that was meant to bring everybody together to start building a common understanding um, about RegTech, um, what RegTech is, what the benefits of RegTech are, and, and a natural way of us all uh, to have this um, meeting place. Now, obviously, this was in uh, this was in a time of face to face, so we've pivoted this into an online program, and uh, we hope that you will enjoy it um, uh, as we as we roll through. Um, uh, I'm also um, I'm also really really thrilled. Uh, and if, for those of you that don't know me, I am Deborah Young, and I'm the CEO of the association. Um, we um, we have online with us today an amazing um, array of industry and participation uh, participants of our industry. And I just wanted to call a few of them out so that you get some idea of the breadth of who's on the line and what the opportunity might look like. So I'd like to welcome members of the media. Um, insurance, uh, banks from uh, both local and offshore, other parts of uh, financial services, uh, regulators, we've got government agencies, we've got investors, uh, payment platforms, uh, other industry associations, we've got uh, consulting firms, universities, research houses, technology companies, both large and small. We've got central banks, uh, trade agencies, and of course, uh, lots of reg techs. Uh, since the lockdown um, due to COVID-19 um, in mid-March, we've exceeded about 1,800 people um, coming to our events from nearly 30 countries. And to give you some idea of the popularity, uh, our newfound uh, popularity, this is nearly double the number for the whole entire previous year. So you're in... Uh, great hands today um, uh, with myself and a number of our uh, presenters, and we really want to try and make the most of this opportunity. Now, when we meet face to face, we normally do uh, a game, and this game is called uh, 15 Seconds. And so what we uh, usually do is that we allow each of our member um, organisations to have 15 se seconds to say who they are and what's the problem that they solve. Now, given that we're on an online format and that will get a little bit tricky to do that in the same way, what I'm offering to you is if you are a member of the RegTech Association, I would love it if you would put in the uh, chat a one-line value proposition about uh, who you are and what the problem is that you're solving. And then furthermore, if you feel comfortable to do that, please put um, a method in there that people could get in touch with you. So I really want to surface uh, to the top um, all those great reg techs, um, all those great reg techs that are out there. So please, um, please do that. If you're not sure whether you remember, uh, please also uh, put a note on there and we'll come back to you and let you know um, whether you are or you aren't. And if you're not a member and you put your value prop up there, well, suffice to say, Alison and I will um, be on the phone to you tomorrow to see how we can engage with you uh, further. So uh, without further ado, we might start um, the first part of the presentation. And here's what we'll cover. We're going to cover a little bit about um, the RegTech Association, uh, why we believe RegTech matters. And we'll uh, cover off some definitions of RegTech, FinTech and SoupTech. We'll talk a little bit about the clusters and the broader ecosystem, why regulated entities and regulators care about RegTech, and we're really super lucky today to have two reg tech firms who are going to present and uh, bring that to life um, uh, for you today. Um, and we will also uh, make it pretty clear about how you can engage with us um, going forward. And if you want to know more about some of the specific reg techs that are either being presented today 
or who you've just seen uh, some slides on whilst you've been waiting, um, then we'll leave you with some thoughts there and also what um, our upcoming programs are going to look like. So uh, if we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the RegTech Association was formed back in 2017 as a non-profit association, and it was addressing um, a collaboration challenge that existed in bringing um, buyers and sellers um, buyers of RegTech and sellers of RegTech uh, together alongside uh, regulators. And at, at the time uh, that the association was established, they set two key goals, if you like, and one was uh, to accelerate adoption of RegTech, and the second one was to create a global centre of excellence. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go through. But to give you some idea, we have 150 organisational members of the association. We bring buyers, sellers, regulators and other interested parties together to have uh, a meaningful conversation. And we do this largely through the programs uh, that we run like this today. Um, we recently launched our new two-year uh, strategy. Um, there were three key strategies and a fourth one snuck in um, called um, COVID-19. And so our first um, key goal over the next uh, foreseeable future, in fact, will be helping our members navigate uh, through the COVID-19 crisis and get to, um, get to some meaningful, I guess, outcomes as uh, we go into recovery mode and what that will mean for everyone. Uh, we'll continue to advocate for the value of RegTech. We'll look to explore new export markets and in fact, even potentially look at some new verticals for RegTech. And I'll touch on uh, that a little bit more in the presentation as well. And uh, do what we can to facilitate more investment flowing in um, to the industry. Thank you. Next slide. So I won't, I won't cover everything off that's on this slide um, because I think it's going to be uh, covered kind of through different parts of the uh, conversation and, and we'll give you the links right at the end. Um, but for everybody to contribute uh, to this industry is making it stronger and that, that has really been evidenced by what I have observed over the last couple of years. So we would love for you to join us. Uh, please reach out. Uh, next slide, please. So this um, goes to show you a little bit of the journey that we've been on, um, and you can see in that um, in the uh, slide there marked uh, December 2018 uh, to July 2019, and you can see um, how much it's grown. Um, this is the uh, slide as it I think yesterday's um, membership. Um, so you can see the trend, uh, the the progress that we're making, and all of the all of the firms on the outside of the circle are the reg tech firms. The firms on the inner part of the circle, on the bottom part, are the regulated entities, and on the uh, top part are what we'd call the intermediary uh, corporate members. Uh, thank you. Next slide. So why does RegTech matter? Well, we believe that RegTech matters to bring efficiency, productivity and trust back to regulated ecosystems. And the transparency that can come from great RegTech um, also benefits consumers. And RegTech can also provide organisations with tools and solutions that really help them to make better business decisions. Now, earlier I mentioned the Global uh, Centre for RegTech Excellence. Um, in late 2017, we published in early 2018 a piece of research that was done by the Boston Consulting Group Expand Research that pointed to Australia as being the third highest centre in the world for reg tech product development. Now, this is uh, perhaps surprising uh, to some in terms when you think about the population of Australia when compared to the US and the UK, uh, but it is actually a robust regulatory environment which has driven this high, um, this high amount of reg tech product development, and that is why we're positioned very well in the world, which is why the RegTech Association um, has grown um, uh, quite significantly over the past um, over the past couple of years. And thank you for those putting uh, your, um, I can see a couple of people putting their information up there, which is great to see. Um, now, one of the questions that I get asked a lot 
is what is the difference between RegTech and FinTech and what is SoupTech? So this slide is a pretty important one because hopefully by the end of it, uh, you'll have a better sense of why we define RegTech uh, separately from FinTech. So we do see RegTech as a range of enabling technologies that solve for regulation and compliance challenges. And, and key there is the word enabler. Um, we see soup tech, and you may hear that often uh, regulators talk about uh, soup tech, and it, and it does normally refer to technologies in their monitoring and supervisory capacity, but we would consider soup tech as part of the reg tech um, family. Uh, but this is where it kind of um, differs a little bit from fintech, because fintech we would generally define as a range of disruptive technologies that are disrupting traditional banking and financial services. And so RegTech, uh, whilst it's most commonly associated with financial services, uh, a good deal of RegTech technologies are in fact uh, sector agnostic. And so they can relate to financial services, they can relate to health services, they can relate to real estate, agriculture, education, any, any vertical that has regulation, uh, RegTech uh, can find a solution for. So I thought we'd um, go through a few um, fast facts of, um, of the RegTech uh, ecosystem. Uh, we did a piece of research uh, late last year of our members, and so the information that's on these slides is actually available from our website in the report um, that we wrote. And this was a RegTech founder perspective of the RegTech ecosystem. So about 79% of our founders are uh, headquartered in Australia with 21% offshore. Now this number, I think if we do this um, research again by the end of this year, uh, that will have changed a little bit. We have a growing number of UK firms coming into membership. 67% of these RegTech founders are headquartered in Sydney, 30% in Melbourne, and the remainder are spread between uh, Canberra, Brisbane, Perth, and Adelaide. Also, what might be interesting to people on the call here today is the maturity of RegTech, if you like. So about 15% of our RegTech firms um, have one year or less, 21% between two and three years, and 64% uh, more, than, more than three years. Next slide, please. So where is our capital coming from? You can see on the left-hand side, this is showing us that 70% of our founders are sourcing their capital actually from themselves. So they're bootstrapping um, largely with angels and high net worths are uh, probably the next group up. We think that there is significantly more work to be done. Um, and if you and if you think about the uh, uh, strategy that I presented earlier in the presentation, there is still more work to be done um, to improve the flow of capital into the sector. Um, I've also just put um, a snapshot. This isn't the whole um, graph, and you can see that in the main research. And I but I've just chosen the the top couple of. Uh, pitch to win ratios. So you can see that around uh, government and around insurance in particular, uh, the industry, the darker blue line is actually the win, the win ratio. So you can see that in financial services, it's a bit more challenging. But um, if we kind of take a sub, a sub segment of financial services and talk about insurers, we've actually got quite a good track record in insurance and we are getting more and more interest from the insurance industry right now. So there's significant growth um, there. And you can see uh, government is another sector as well. Um, and you can also see here in the third uh, graph, uh, the number of full production deployments over the past year. So that would have been calendar year 2019, doesn't include any data from 2020 yet. But you can see that um, we were definitely getting to some full uh, deployments um, across uh, the scale, and the report has more has more detail. Um, next slide, please. Now, this is um a, uh, this is something that we call time to value. So, time to value, we talk about that in terms of uh, from an initial conversation right through to full production, and how long is that taking? When I first um, took um, took on this role with the RegTech Association, we would in common terms talk about 24 months as not being uncommon. 
And whilst we still do have some outliers and where there are deeply integrated uh, solutions in financial services, 13.3 um, is probably not representative. It probably is closer to the 20 to 24 uh, months. But by and large, the time to value across all customers is about 13 months from initial conversation to full production. And once again, more information on that in, um, in that report. So the reg tech clusters. Now we're actually doing some significant work here at the moment. Um, and so watch this space. We, we're really looking to set upon some standards by which um, we actually uh, determine what the reg tech clusters are. Um, and, and what we're aiming to do is try and get to a global standard so that when everybody's talking about it, we're talking about it in consistent ways. But anyway, for now, we kind of say there are four main clusters and you can see them on the left-hand side, validation, monitoring, risk management and compliance. And then as we drill down a little bit further, our research report revealed that 27% are risk and fraud analytics. And I won't read them all out, but you can see um, as we go down the different kinds of reg tech and some of the problems that they are solving for. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about the reg tech ecosystem, who is actually included there? Uh, once again, I won't um, I won't call all of these out, but you can see that it's a very broad array of people who all play their role in um, making this uh, fantastic ecosystem that we talk about. And many of them, it's almost as if I wrote this slide for who was on the call today. I did not, in fact, but um, this has probably realised a bit of a dream for us to actually have, I think, just about everybody um, on the call today uh, represents one of these circles. Uh, thank you. Next slide. So why do regulators uh, care about reg tech? Um, look, uh, pure and simple, this creates better outcomes for consumers um, right at the, at the top of that list. Um, it obviously helps with the stability and the reliability of the system and builds a culture of compliance. Reg regulators want to see great reg tech deployed. And, and I'll talk about some examples of that in a second. Um, and regulators can also be buyers of reg tech um, too. Um, we currently work with all of the Australian financial services regulators in, in various ways. Uh, we've recently had um, an expression of interest from um, an overseas regulator to participate in some of our work. Um, but to give you some examples, um, ASIC run a range of uh, reg tech programs um, that we contribute to. Um, they run a quarterly ASIC reg tech liaison forum that we often uh, present at that. Um, I'm part of the, I'm an observer on the, reg, uh, the ASIC um, digital um, committee. Um, we work with Austrac also in a very deep and meaningful way. We have co-branded a series of uh, tech sprints that we work with them with them on. We have done in the past and we expect to do so in the future. And we have played a role um, when APRA was uh, seeking their new data collection uh, platform. We helped um, bring them closer together with all of the reg tech uh, vendors to really understand um, what the impacts of um, a good reg tech solution was going to look like for them. And then we were able, uh, once they had chosen their vendor, to bring that vendor uh, close, close together with some of our reg tech members to talk through um, some uh, perceptions that there were, that there were going to be some challenges and we were actually able to do that. So we're working with them all in um, many different ways. And so they've become a very, very important part of our, of our universe. Um, next slide, uh, please. So why um, is RegTech critical for regulated entities? Well, the, the costs of compliance are increasing. In 2018, it was estimated that banks were spending 270 billion US dollars per year on compliance and something like 10% or more of the bank's operating costs uh, were attributed to compliance. And some estimates um, have said that regulatory costs um, would double by 2022. Um, Regulators have fined banks for non-compliance, exceeding US uh, $10 billion in the 15 months uh, leading up to 2019. So this gives you 
um, some idea about why RegTech is so critical um, for regulated entities. But, you know, furthermore, to my earlier comments, you know, uh, RegTech can provide tools to them to manage and monitor all facets of risk, brings transparency and information to boards um, and to shareholders, and in particular for boards and executive teams, you know, gives them the tools to help them make better uh, decisions whilst increasing um, efficiency and productivity. Um, next slide, please. So this is um, possibly the most exciting part of um, our program uh, today. So this is what I've been talking about. And what we're going to hear from are two reg tech firms who are going to um, uh, uh, present to you around their different solutions and the problems that they're solving for. So I'd like to um, introduce you to Siobhan Hartnell. Uh, Siobhan is an integral part of Feature Space's success in having uh, progressed quickly since joining them in 2017. She's established herself as a champion and advocate for the company's growth by challenging the status quo to ensure customers have access to leading machine learning and AI solutions for financial crime risk management for fraud and AML. During her time at Feature Space, the organisation has successfully deployed its real-time, fully adaptive models to major uh, processes like TSIS and four of the four of the top five largest banks in the UK. Leveraging expertise gained from her contributions to the building of the company's European business, Siobhan plays a, cru a crucial role in creating the strategy for Feature Space's expansion into Australia and Asia Pacific, and now leads its development and execution. Uh, a big warm welcome to you, Siobhan, if you don't mind, um, you can put on your um, your camera too, if you'd like, and make sure that we can hear you. Hi, Deb. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for having me in on um, RegTech in the Bag today. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to to talk a little bit about feature space and, and what we're doing in this space. Um, can we hop to the next slide? So I think one of the places that I, I'm quite keen to start on is, is around payments. So payments are integral to our global economy and something that we interact with on a on a day to day um, basis. Payments are accelerating in speed, they're growing in number, and they're also evolving from kind of old payments infrastructures that we've had in place for 20 to 30 years to new ones that we've been putting in place over the past you know, 10 to 15 years. To give you an idea of this kind of acceleration, a card transaction has to occur within a 300 millisecond window. We're now able to do bank to bank transfers instantly 24 seven and seven days a week. Whereas previously, um, and in, you know, with some banks, um, it still takes say three to four days in order to process that transaction, um, but you can only do that kind of uh, you know, during the week. In terms of growth, we're actually expecting for um, global payment revenues to increase by a trillion dollars by 2023. That's across the entire kind of ecosystem of payments from commercial payments to retail payments. And really that shows the, the, the amount of data that is going to be going through kind of financial institutions, financial services that we need to be protecting from both fraud and from money laundering. Finally, one of the things I want to touch on is just the evolution of, of payment. So one of the big things that's happened since um, coronavirus started um, earlier this year is that since March 2020, there's been a 74% growth in average online retail sales. We're seeing this migration from card present transactions to card not present. Additionally, um, the new payments platform that was set up back in 2018 um, across Australia is now averaging 1.1 million payments per day. All of these factors together are actually creating new avenues for um, criminals in order to exploit, but also we need to be getting smarter about how we're actually managing the risks around this. Um, next slide, please. So I'm sure you guys are aware of kind of different news articles that have been coming out. So some of the ones that I, um, I want to pick up on are um, around, for example, scams. 
So particularly since um, coronavirus has started, actually we've been seeing a lot of scaremongering, um, which, you know, it's you know, pretty terrible taking advantage of people. But we're seeing that, for example, in Singapore in Q1 this year, there was $41.3 million that was lost to lost to scams, which is pretty compelling considering um, uh, considering the population population of Singapore is uh, several several million. Um, what we're seeing is that some governments, for example, in the UK, are now implementing, recognising this as a, as a problem and are implementing things like the contingent reimbursement model, whereas actually we're seeing kind of other regulators in other parts of the world are, are starting to kind of catch up around this area. Another area to raise is kind of, um, I know that you guys are probably all aware of kind of Westpac's um, recent AML um, uh, money laundering scandal. And one of the things that, that's really important to, to note is that with real-time payments, there will be a migration to also having real-time money laundering. And actually with this real-time element and the convenience that it affords us, actually we also need to make sure that we are kind of bolstering ourselves and protecting ourselves from, from potential criminal activity. Next slide, please. So um, a lot of um, financial institutions are looking at different ways in which they can they can basically monitor their risks, comply with regulations in a smarter way. So actually, a lot of institutions have looked to, to employ um, and use machine learning. Machine learning isn't actually a new thing. It's, it's been around a long time. The things that are really revolutionizing machine learning are now the fact that we have more storage capacity and also more processing power, which really means that we can we can really bolster up our machine learning and, and, and really realize its, its full potentials. Uh, next, please. So in terms of kind of, I guess, more traditional machine learning approaches that a lot of organizations are taking or, or even evaluating, um, essentially these models will be built on three to six months worth of historic data. You'll initially see an uptick in that performance, but it, within a few months, you'll actually see degradation. And actually there's kind of this continuous kind of back and forth of having to retune the models or even having to take them completely offline, build new ones and put them in place. So what feature space, uh, what we're doing and we're bringing to the market is our proprietary adaptive behavioral analytics, which are truly adaptive self-learning models that don't require any manual retuning and actually automatically retrain on the fly. So by putting one of these models live, not only is it kind of retuning as it goes along, but and um, having an uplift in the performance from the different machine learning techniques that we're actually using. But when it's seeing new and evolving fraud trends or money laundering trends is actually able to uptick in the performance that it provides because it recognizes that that is anomalous um, and therefore feeds back into the system. Uh, next, please. So, to give you a bit of background as to feature space, so we do real time fraud and financial crime prevention. We were born out of 30 years worth of research at Cambridge University. We are the inventors of adaptive behavioral analytics. We're trusted by some of the most respected banks and payments companies in the world. We're world leaders in machine learning for solving risk challenges. And we use unique real-time machine learning method methodology, which is supported by a meticulously selected infrastructure to ensure that these machine learning models are executing in millisecond response times, even at scale when, for example, there's billion transactions going through a platform. And within all of this, we're multi-award winning um, and have proven time and time again throughout multiple head-to-head -head proof of concepts that, that we have some of the best machine learning models. Next, please. So in terms of customers, um, we have kind of a range of customers globally. Um, so some of the, the, the um, most notable ones are, for example, HSBC. Uh, we also work with WorldPay, protecting their hundreds of merchants. We also work with TSIS, with whom we provide a score to 12 of their different member banks, as well as also working with some of the more kind of smaller organizations that are looking to start on a best in class infrastructure. So you guys might be aware of um, ClearBank that's owned by a, a fellow Aussie, uh, Nick, Nick Ogden. Um, so yeah, so this gives you a bit of a, you know, an overview of who we work with. So what I want to do now is, is talk to you guys a little bit about the case studies. 
Um, so um, TSIS, um, Total Systems, whom we work with, we provide a score to uh, 12 of their different member banks. And really, this has been from a proliferation of data breaches that actually this has fueled card not present fraud. We've seen globally a lot of organizations, um, regulators put in uh, regulations such as PSD2 in Europe and the card mitigation framework in Australia in order to, to curb CNP fraud. But actually, um, alongside kind of like TSIS and in these partnerships, we've been able to kind of leverage this really great data pool that they sit on in order to provide a really, really compelling score to their different members, which through its kind of automatic retraining has proven in real live ex uh, examples to pick up evolving fraud trends. Um, this is outbeat kind of their incumbent score. Um, and, and there's kind of like a, a continued migration from a lot of their, their banks to utilizing this. Next, please. So I'm sure that all of you are aware of kind of like this, you know, the continued um, AML, um, you know, money laundering um, challenges that are that are ongoing. And we're seeing kind of like this become more prolific with kind of real time payments facilitating real time money laundering and also with recent scandals such as 1MDB and then also with the Westpac. Um, money laundering scandal as, as well. So we were um, em employed by um, a global tier one bank and actually we were able to provide really, really compelling results to them using our very unique machine learning techniques. We were able to reduce their overall alerts by 12%, which for a tier one global bank is, is quite compelling. But even more com compelling than that, we were able to prioritize the alerts in a way that they only needed to work 5% of their alerts in order to find 100% um, of all of their existing SA, um, SAR or SMR reports. And they were able to find them one month earlier. So these compelling results have actually driven us to, to now deploying this on a global scale for them, for which they will see kind of that operational uplift as well as detection capabilities as well. Next, please. I think the, the final side I want to talk about is, is kind of this, this bridge between regulation, meeting regulation, but then also kind of trying to achieve operational um, efficiency. And really what we're seeing is really this convergence and this movement at the moment between kind of fraud and financial crime um, across the entire kind of fraud landscape in order to make sure that people are fully utilizing the data um, that they have and, and sharing those insights. So this is a large US bank that we work with. Before we implemented with them, they had multiple existing fraud systems for which their fraud agents were, were viewing many, many different, different screens. Um, next, please. Um, after we implemented with them, what we did was we actually implemented one platform, so one ARIC risk hub, for which there were three different machine learning models. One that was looking at application fraud and looking at kind of how people were applying for those accounts. One that was looking across the entire transactional ecosystem in order to understand what those normal behaviors were. And a final model to actually look at kind of how they were maintaining, how they were managing their accounts. And sharing these insights between these different areas meant that actually this bank now has a completely holistic insight as to how their customers are behaving meaning that they're actually able to achieve an 85% uh, detection rate at a 1.4 to 1 false positive rate. So this is incredibly compelling for them and something that actually now we're seeing a lot of organizations move to and actually also incorporating that money laundering um, aspect as well to further bolster on that holistic view. Next, please. So that's um, all that I've got for you guys today. Um, you know, if you if you would like um, you know a free consultation with one of our kind of financial crime, crime experts, more than happy to to offer that. The the link is on there. But but otherwise, Deb, thank you so much for for having us on. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, are there any questions for Siobhan? I'll just give that like thirty seconds uh, for you to pop your question up. Um, so maybe to, maybe in the meantime, while people are thinking about that, uh, Siobhan, I've got two questions for you. One is that um, you are based in Singapore right now, and is and that's where the um, the local presence will be run out of. Is that is that correct? And then I guess lastly, that's just from a practical uh, perspective. And then um, lastly, what's the 
uh, what's the question that people should be asking that perhaps haven't? Oh, there you go. Uh, no. Um, so what's the question um, that you think that people should be asking that they haven't asked? Yeah, um, that's a really good one. Um, so, so in terms of our kind of local presence, um, so currently we have a local presence. Um, so we have an incorporated entity in, in Australia and we have a presence in Singapore. Um, we're seeing a lot of kind of organic interest throughout the region. So we'll be building out both of those centres in order right. to support existing and new clients. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the questions that, that people should be asking, um, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a really interesting one. I think the thing that I, I personally find quite quite interesting is is kind of um, is is the fact that with kind of these different regulations and these different, um, I guess, financial um, crime aspects, is you you've always got this kind of cat and mouse chase between regulators that are going and putting in these regulations to bolster and protect consumers, but actually, are financial institutions asking? Do we what what is the value? Do we need to wait for regulators to go and do this? And actually, what is the value outside of this that we can bring to our organization? Um, so there's a lot of, lot to be said from like actually, um, you know, there's been there's been a few articles written by the, by quite a few analysts recently around actually like putting these systems in place and and continuously improving them actually improves not only your customer experience but actually the the overall kind of value of customer proposition and value of your your organization. So um, so yeah, so I think that that people need to be looking at this from like a multi faceted aspect. Sure. That's great. Um, uh, so there is a question, uh, Siobhan. Um, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, how new PSA 2019 regulated entities, PSBs and crypto token operators can benefit from your solution? So how um, can, I think it should be how can, yeah. <laughs> So, um, so I have to admit, so um, in terms of like crypto tokens, so we haven't been working so much in this space, but really I think it's the kind of like the transactional data and those elements that, that we are kind of working more with financial services in order to profile that data, in order to have a more holistic understanding of those customers, in order to understand those risks, risks around it. Um, I would say that we haven't so far been working so much in, 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 the, in the crypto space, but, but considering that that is becoming more prolific, I think that we will be moving more towards that space. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ina, uh, for that question. And thank you very much, uh, Siobhan. I uh, really appreciate the time taken uh, today. Um, I'm going to move on to our next um, case study. Uh, if I can invite... Um, Neil to uh, the screen. Um, Neil is Miko's Head of Business Development in the Australasian region. He has more than 30 years experience delivering business value through tech solutions across a broad range of industries. And he is still passionate about ensuring uh, customers get what they need. He's worked in a diverse range of organisations ranging from major enterprises to small startups and covering a wide range of industries, including media, publishing, digital, telco, health services, pharmaceutical, wagering, and financial services. Prior to MECO, Neil successfully drove large-scale programs of work for complex stakeholder groups with world-first digital solutions and mission-critical application deployments to his credit. This diversity of industry types, scale of operations and experiences has helped Neil hone a set of skills to em enable him to identify and define solutions that solve real world problems for businesses and their customers. Uh, a warm welcome uh, to Neil Campbell from Miko, everybody. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks, Deborah and the RegTech Association for the opportunity to talk with you today about Miko and what we're doing in the regulatory technology space. Um, so um, what I'd like to talk about, um, first of all, so Miko is, um, uh, is a pioneer in the area of personal data management, and we were founded in Australia in 2012 by Katrina Dow, who, who continues as our CEO and Group Managing Director. And since then, we've grown from an early startup uh, to an organisation of around 20 staff with operations in Australia, Belgium and the UK. Back in 2012, uh, Katrina was concerned about where she saw the use of personal data heading and the impending risks to privacy and control of data by the individual. 
so in creating Nico, she first started by writing a manifesto. And in summary, that's what you've got up on the screen at the moment, that our vision is to create a place for everyone to get equity and value in exchange for the data they share. And this is still the basis on which the company operates and makes decisions today. Next slide, please. As was predicted, the exponential growth of data and data usage since those early days of MECO has increasingly raised privacy concerns and regulatory reactions. Prominent examples such as the breaches of trust by Equifax and Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, they've highlighted the, the misuse and mismanagement of personal data, which has resulted in unprecedented fines and the significant erosion of trust with consumers. As a result, we've seen an increasing number of major regulatory initiatives developed and implemented across the globe that are seeking to restore an appropriate balance between the rights of individuals and commercial operations of business. And particularly, you'd, you'd look at uh, examples such as the GDPR and the PSD2 in Europe and in Australia, the consumer data right and where that's heading in Australia. As Deborah explained before, our regulated industries, um, uh, for, for all of the regulated industries, the cost of compliance and the financial impact of non-compliance is becoming unbearable. On top of that, the resulting friction co for consumers caused by having to repeat onerous compliance processes like KYC are strong use cases for more human-centric and, and customer-focused solutions. And really, this is where the regtech industry and, and MECO comes in. Next slide, please. So let me tell you a bit about MECO and its value proposition. What we can see is that individuals are increasingly gaining the legal rights to manage and control their data. As a result, businesses now need to rethink how they collect, store and exchange customer information. And to support this, MECO's award-winning and patent technology uh, enables businesses to bring their compliance and personal data regulation um, obligations, uh, along with the, and to add to that, the creation of new commercial models and services. With MECO solutions, businesses can increase trust and reduce friction through transparent personal data enabled services. And MECO's personal data API platform delivers customer centric solutions using a privacy by design and security by design architecture with a full audit and consent trail capability. Next slide, please. To deliver its solutions, Miko's personal and identity API platform has been built to provide industry-leading capabilities that can be integrated into enterprise solutions. And to do this, these, we've, we've got a, a, a set of capabilities built around uh, a secure data enclave or a vault that provides secure storage and retrieval of encrypted personal data, a consent engine to control and track how and when and with whom data is shared and used, a personal data event, a personal event ledger that's a unique and immutable log of API events, which provides strong assertion for fraud management, identification, authorization, and authentication. Uh, a trusted connections capability that enables data trust and sharing between people and organizations and things. Also a, a decentralized verified credentials wallet. And this is enabling the creation of um, uh, the creation, the verification and sharing of credentials based on the W3C standards and connecting credentials issuers and relying parties. Uh, we also have a personal financial management module that supports, op supports open banking integrations and a developer portal for the rapid prototyping and product development, um, which also includes a software development kit and supporting documentation. Next slide, please. I'd now like to, to talk with you about some of the implications and directions around personal data regulation that we're seeing. In February 2020, the European Commission released their document a European strategy for data. It describes how the EU intends to become a major player in the new data economy and to hold its own against other world powers. We see this as a, a critical, critical document for understanding where the world's heading in the use of data. So we've published a review of this strategy and its implications. 
in our paper, we're specifically drawing a, a contrast between the EU model uh, where we see operating and what we see operating elsewhere, such as in China and the USA. The EU strategy is framed around nine common industry and service data spaces. And at Miko, we see that, that each data space is supported by how personal data is governed. That's because the EU Commission continues to place the citizen at the centre of the data equation. Uh, and it also envisages a world where the ethical use of data within a GDPR regulated framework can gener generate new business models. This view aligns well with Miko's philosophy and we believe that citizens, uh, students, patients, passengers, consumers, in fact, every individual should be enabled to be more equitably able to, to join the value chains that uh, data fuels. And that this will ultimately lead to greater trust and personalization and a more prosperous society. However, all of this requires new commercial models um, it requires enforceable regulations and it requires digital tools to transform our connected society. You can download Miko's review from our website or, or you can contact me and I'll send you a link to that. Our review also includes some case studies that help illustrate the implications of the strategy and, and I'd like to briefly take you through one of those that I think has relevance for the, the, the discussion today. Thanks. So KBC is one of the leading retail banks in Belgium with three and a half million customers. It was voted the best digital bank in 2019 and the independent consultancy firm Brand Finance recently named KBC the most valuable brand in Belgium for the fifth consecutive time. KBC is leading the way in the provision of value-added services for their mobile customers. And by taking uh, an ecosystem approach uh, KBC is providing customers with direct access to vital everyday services like uh, public transport, uh, bike rentals and things like that through their bank app. In 2019, uh, KBC engaged Miko to provide a digital safe as a product as, that was part of their ecosystem. While the digital safe is accessible through the mobile banking app, the security architecture and customer access that Miko designed ensures that only the customer can, com, has complete control over the data and documents of their digital safe. From a business perspective, this strategy is very customer centric and it demonstrates the value of the bank for digital services beyond just banking. It also provides for multiple touch points daily with the customer with resulting opportunities to build the relationship and to build customer loyalty. Leveraging bank trust and bank security has helped to overcome customer concerns associated with the collection, access and control of sensitive personal data as well. Just as physical bank vaults have been used for centuries to hold important assets and documents. The use of a separation of concerns architecture has provided a great foundation to enable customers to have privacy and control with the bank developing a range of value added and regulatory compliant services. In the context of PSD2 and open banking, KBC is now well positioned to extend the digital safe to a range of use cases and enabling customers to directly participate by making their personal data and consent available real time. With the advent of consumer data right legislation in Australia and similar initiatives in other jurisdictions, this use case can have direct relevance to many world markets where evolving regulatory regimes can generate new services and revenue streams rather than just compliance obligations. Next slide, please. So to wrap up uh, today's presentation, uh, Miko has class leading products that enable our customers to develop new business models in a regulated environment. We're actively engaged with regulatory standards and protocol bodies that are driving change across the globe so our customers can be confident in the solutions we provide. In fact, we've been recognised as a leader in personal data products, uh, personal identity products in the, the latest one world identity industry landscape alongside such uh, brands as Apple, MasterCard, Visa and Civic. Next slide, please. Um, Thanks all for listening today. And if you'd like uh, um, any further information about Miko or like me to provide you with a 
with access to our EU data strategy review document, then please contact, contact me. And you can use that uh, QR code on the screen now if you just wanted to, to grab my details straight to your phone. Thanks, everyone, and, uh, and back to you, Deb. Uh, thanks, Neil. Um, uh, once again, I'll, I'll give people an opportunity to ask Neil a question. Um, one of the things that you just talked about in relation to KBC Bank, Neil, did you develop that private safe uh, or digital safe, sorry, did you develop that especially for them and is that part of your uh, product suite going forward or was that something just tailored specifically for them? So what we what we had was we already had the foundation of that product. Um, there were some unique elements that were developed for them, which uh, are now also part of our product. Um, right. It was interesting that um, uh, we we had a um, a very secure and encrypted uh, uh, access for that uh, for our vault. Um, but as uh, they saw with their customers, that they didn't believe that some of their customers were ready to. Um, to store their, their uh, secure passphrase in a way that uh, if they forgot it, that was it, their data was gone. Um, yes. And so what we developed was a, uh, a secure way of separating out in the vault um, the, uh, their access so that uh, if they did lose their, their passphrase, that there was a way without compromising security and without the bank or ourselves knowing about that data to be able to recover that information. So that was a key part that was a difference and that's now part of our product. Oh, uh, excellent. Yes, excellent. Um, so uh, perhaps I should ask you the same question that I asked Siobhan, which was not really a question. It was more, what do you, what, what's the question that we should have been asking you today that perhaps didn't come up and something that you think um, is a good insight around the work that you're doing or potentially in relation to, obviously in Australia on the 1st of July, we'll, we'll go into the... Um, open banking environment. Um, so perhaps you could, perhaps that that that's the question about you know what next uh, for Miko and open banking, or is there something that we've that we've missed today that we it's worth highlighting? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, the the situation with the consumer data rights a really important one because um, you know as you say uh, after a few deferrals uh, we are actually going live with that uh, from the first of July with the four major banks um, and. Similar regimes are happening across the globe uh, to this. It progressively uh, flows through, we've seen, uh, across many jurisdictions. And um, I think uh, that what we've seen in Australia has been that um, the, the first focus is about how do we make sure that we're going to be compliant and, and meet the obligations that the, the government's uh, applied to this. But the second wave is that we're, we're seeing and, and talking to a couple of um, of the banks, uh, particularly the mid-tier mid ones, they're really seeing this as the opportunity to grow their market share. Um, I think the, the, the benefit for the large banks, though, is to not look at this as the risk of losing customers, but also by adding new services on the back of the, the CDR, they can actually uh, retain customers, but potentially grow their own market share as well. And I think that's that's a key to it, to, it, um, to, to see what, what are those services that can... can uh, can also be leveraged here. And when you look at CDR, I mean, uh, there's already um, uh, in the last few weeks, uh, the Treasurer has uh, kicked off the process for the extension of um, CDR into the energy sector. So this, yes. is, this is a growing regulatory area and, and one where I think um, every industry is going to be able to learn from those that go before. Well, that's um, a perfect um, spot to finish on really because this is all along the lines of what we've been saying from the beginning is that reg tech um, reg tech is not just about financial services it can uh, be broader than that and it can be applied in energy and any other regulated industry vertical so that's uh, something close to my heart so um, Neil thank you so much um, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, today um, I'd like to thank um, both Neil and Siobhan very much um, uh, by presenting these case studies really helps um, us be able to bring uh, RegTech to life. Uh, so I'm hoping that you enjoyed that. I'd also like to thank Alison, uh, our Head of Engagement, who uh, faithfully sits there behind the scenes and uh, changes all the slides so that we don't have any technical issues. So thank you very much um, to Alison. Um, What's next? We've got a couple of exciting things coming up. Um, we've just been talking about the consumer data right and we're doing a session on Thursday. It's not too late to register um, for that. 
we have the chair of the consumer data body uh, joining us along with some other speakers. So please um, register. You can find that um, link on our website. And during May, June, July and uh, onwards, we will be running regular RegTech Edge No Borders. Um, these programs are showcase programs. And so if you are looking or considering different kinds of RegTech around um, different kinds of solutions, um, this is the place to be. Um, each RegTech firm will get five minutes to present their particular solution. So if you're looking for something around digital identity or KYC, or if you're looking around people risks, financial crime, and so the list goes on, then uh, catch one of these uh, RegTech Edge No Borders uh, programs. And these have quickly uh, gained some global notoriety, which is why we're calling them No Borders now. So these are, in fact, our global programs. Uh, so a great um, place for you to A, present if you're a member of the association, or B, attend those as, as a nice, uh, safe place to come and see uh, the potential of what's on offer here at the RegTech Association. And then last but not least, um, 18th of March 2021 is the date for our uh, postponed Accelerate RegTech um, event that was due to take place in March of this year. We have postponed it to March of next year. Watch this space. Um, we're really quite excited about developing a brand new program um, for that session. So I want to thank you all very much uh, for joining us today. Thanks for taking the time. If you like this, please uh, tell some people. Um, and we will be sending a survey um, out after this um, session. It'd be really great if you just take a few minutes to fill that in because that helps us um, keep our pencil uh, sharpened and keep these uh, sessions relevant uh, to you. And we also recorded today's session so it'll be available on our website as well. So without further ado, I'll say uh, cheerio for now and um, we'll see you all again very soon, if not on Thursday. Thanks a lot.